Okay, good morning, everyone. Can you all hear me? Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Uh, my name is Surya Moon, and I wanted to just thank the um, organizers for the opportunity to be here with you. It is a, it's a great pleasure to be with so many people with expertise in this uh, in this pretty specialized area, as uh, Sean was saying earlier. And it's also a privilege to be able to present to you all. And I look forward to the comments that you'll have uh, and the questions that you'll raise during the, the discussion section. Um, as, as I uh, write on the title slide of my, my presentation, what I'm about to present is work in progress. So I very much uh, welcome any challenges that you might raise to, to the analysis that I'm going to present. So my presentation is focusing on the right to access to medicines and in particular the application of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights to the pharmaceutical industry. And I'll go into an introduction of what those guidelines are in just, uh, just a couple of minutes. The two key questions that I tried to address uh, in the draft paper and as well as in this presentation are first, do pharmaceutical companies have human rights obligations? And if so, what are they? Uh, and second, what are the implications of the 2011 uh, UN guiding principles? So quickly, I'll just provide a brief introduction. I'll introduce the guiding principles, which are also more uh, colloquially known as the REGI framework uh, or the Protect, Respect, Remedy framework. Um, go a bit into the uh, an introduction of the Hunt guidelines, which Professor Chapman already mentioned this morning. Um, and look at some of the Hunt guidelines which were issued in 2008 in light of the Brady framework which came three years later, and then offer some conclusions for the broader questions regarding the obligations of, of the pharmaceutical industry. So just as a quick introduction, I think I don't need to go into any detail regarding the importance of access to medicines as a part of the right to health, and the fact that this is quite, uh, in 2013, this is quite a well-established uh, part of the right to health. Uh, state obligations are, I would say, relatively clear, clear, if not relatively clear, in the international human rights framework uh, to protect, respect, and fulfill the right to health. But for many years, the obligations of non-state actors were, uh, were unclear. And, and whether we use the word responsibilities or obligations is even still, still contested. Of course, when we talk about the right to health and access to medicines in particular, the most relevant industry is the pharmaceutical industry. And on the one hand, when we think about the pharmaceutical industry, particularly over the last uh, 12 or 13 years, we see a number of quote-unquote access policies that have been put in place to respond to the social mobilization and the political pressure that, uh, that the industry has been under. So for example, we have donation programs, uh, tiered pricing that is offering lower prices in uh, lower income countries or markets, uh, licensing initiatives and research and development partnerships, particularly around the neglected diseases. So we see that the industry is actually responding to uh, social demands to, to do more for access to medicine, particularly in lower middle income countries. At the same time, we have an industry that operates with little transparency regarding a whole um, host of uh, aspects of its operations, uh, an industry that often engages in very effective lobbying, both to weaken, for example, price containment measures, uh, to strengthen intellectual property protection and other forms of market exclusivity, such as data exclusivity, uh, that engages in unethical drug promotion and has recently been hit with a number of record-breaking fines as a result of this in, in high-income countries, as well as in uh, sometimes questionable clinical trials. So a very complex industry with many implications for, um, for human rights. Let me just take a step back from, from the pharmaceutical industry, which is uh, of the motivation for this presentation, and give you a bit of background of where the REGI framework uh, came from. So the REGI framework the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights were not developed specifically for the pharmaceutical industry. And to my knowledge, in the published literature, there's not been an analysis uh, of how the, that framework might apply. What it did come out of was a, uh, a frustration, a growing frustration, particularly at the beginning of uh, this century, regarding the lack of clarity around the business, uh, human rights obligations of businesses, when businesses were clearly exerting more and more of an impact um, at the, at, uh, in all countries, across all industries, on the enjoyment of basic human rights. Some of the challenges that came up were around state failure and what are called sometimes weak governance zones. So when states actually fail to fulfill their own obligations, uh, were businesses then obligated to step in, particularly in areas where they're operating? Uh, some issues arose around major power differentials, particularly between smaller or poorer states and large and extremely powerful and well-resourced multinational corporations engaging in negotiations. Uh, and what 
what resulted from this uh, very broad background context was, was generally a lack of clarity and often a conflation of roles as to what states and businesses were responsible for. And this was the state of the debate uh, about 10 years ago. There was an attempt to clarify uh, the debate that, that did not win widespread political support from member states of the UN, and as a result of that attempt at the beginning part of the century, the UN Secretary General appointed uh, a special representative on business and human rights, uh, who's John Ruggie. And John Ruggie from 2005 to 2011, over a six year period, uh, developed a set of principles that I've mentioned, uh, the Protect, Respect, Remedy principles, uh, through a global consultative process involving states, uh, industry, civil society, and a whole host of, of actors. The UN Human Rights Council endorsed these guidelines in 2011 as the first time that the Human Rights Council had done so. So while they are not universally endorsed, they have been extremely widely endorsed. Uh, and I, I would say, if we wanted to summarize the key principle advanced by the Ready Framework, it's that states and business, in fact, have different responsibilities and that it's important to differentiate what those are in order to make progress and to make the application of of human rights norms more uh, operationalizable for rights such as access to medicine. So what is the Protect, Respect, Remedy framework? I'll just go through it uh, briefly. First, when we talk about states, uh, it's a state duty to protect, particularly um, to protect against human rights abuses by third parties, including business. And Ruggie, the Ruggie framework puts forward the duty to protect within the broader state obligations of respect, respect and protecting and fulfilling. I think there's not a lot of controversy there. The second is really where I think the heart of the framework lies, and that is the role of business enterprises as specialized organs of society performing specialized functions, which who are required to comply with all applicable laws and to respect human rights. And so he puts a very heavy emphasis on compliance with existing laws and norms uh, and respect. And then there's the third element, which is remedy, which is the need for rights and obligations to be matched with appropriate and effective remedy when breached. I'm going to really focus this presentation on the second pillar uh, uh, because of time limitations. I won't go into detail on, on the third on remedy. Okay. So when he discusses this notion of respect, he also he goes into a little bit more detail. What does it actually mean to respect? It's a, it can be a very broad term and it can be interpreted in, in different ways. So he notes that in addition to compliance with national laws, the baseline responsibility of companies is to respect human rights, and to respect rights essentially means not to infringe on the rights of others, but simply to do no harm. Again, respect can be a very complex concept, but here we're boiling it down to the very basics, and I apply this later on to the guidelines that Paul Hunt advanced to see if there is there a difference between baseline obligations to respect and other socially desirable obligations or um, measures. Uh, he goes a bit further to explain uh, how we might interpret the notion of respect. He notes that business enterprises may undertake other commitments or activities to support and promote human rights, which may contribute to the enjoyment of rights, or what I would say the fulfillment of rights. But this does not offset a failure to respect human rights throughout their operations. And I think this is really the key notion, that it's not possible, for example, for a business to make a drug donation or to offer a price discount, and that that would offset lobbying activities that may in fact undermine in a much uh, broader and systematic way the right to access to medicines. And there is, in, he does not put it forward this way, but I think there is certainly an implicit two-tier framework in, uh, in the Protect Respect Remedy Framework, which is a baseline of respect of do no harm, and as a secondary layer of both are socially desirable practices uh, to fulfill the right to health. So I'm going to take this framework and try to apply it now to the guidelines that were issued three years earlier by Paul Hunt, who, as we've heard, was the first uh, special rapporteur on the right to health. Uh, Paul Hunt issued human rights guidelines for pharmaceutical industries in relation to access to medicines in 2008, at the end of his term, again, after a globally consultative process involving uh, states, uh, industry, um, civil society, and academics. The guidelines include uh, 47 specific guidelines. They're very wide ranging. They cover a broad set of issue areas from transparency to management practices to lobbying, uh, research, patents, licensing, and pricing. I think a key uh, phrase that, that precedes the guidelines, uh, and one way in which we can understand them, is that, that they are exhortatory and not obligatory. And so Paul Hen himself wrote, the guidelines do not use the peremptory word must but the more modest language should. 
So we can consider that the 47 guidelines that he put forward, he believes are all what he would say should or what I would call socially desirable, but he didn't necessarily assert that these were obligations in the sense of must. What I'd like to argue is that, in fact, a number of obligations, uh, guidelines, excuse me, that he put forward do fall under the category of must if we read them in light of the ready guidelines which were developed, uh, of course, after, after the Hunt guidelines. So I'm just going to go through a few of them, and because this is an audience that's particularly interested in intellectual property, I pulled up not all 47 guidelines, but in fact the ones that I think are most relevant for the debates that we'll be engaging in over the next couple of days. So I'll go through a few examples and try to illustrate where the, uh, the idea of must uh, comes in, uh, which is when pharmaceutical companies are being asked to respect human rights, versus when socially desirable or should comes into play. So. I noticed that the, um, it may be a bit difficult, especially in the back of the room, to see the text up here, so I'll just summarize each of the guidelines instead of expecting that you'll be able to read through them. So in the beginning, we start quite generally. Uh, guideline number four uh, calls on companies to refrain from any conduct that may encourage a state to act in a way that is inconsistent with its human rights obligations. I think that is clearly a, uh, a call to do no harm, and I would say this is easily under the umbrella of respect. Second, a company should be as transparent as possible on a number of different uh, factors, particularly on issues relating to access to medicines. Again, uh, a clear case of do no harm. Moving quickly into um, areas that are linked to lobbying and advocacy, uh, the guidelines call for a company to disclose all current advocacy and lobbying positions that may that impact or may impact upon access to medicines. Uh, to disclose financial or other support to key opinion leaders, such as patient associations, political parties, etc., the which it seeks to influence public policy. And third, to uh, require that recipients of financial support from the company publicly disclose such support. Because transparency is one of the key ways in which the Ruggie framework is to be operationalized, it's one of the fundamental principles of how we know whether or not companies are in fact respecting human rights. Uh, I would say that all three of these easily fall under the umbrella of respect and are certainly uh, obligations that companies must, um, must carry out. Moving into a bit more complex territory, uh, the next set of guidelines looks at research and development, particularly around neglected diseases. So according to the Paul Hunt guidelines, companies should make a public commitment to contribute to research and development for neglected diseases and to publicly disclose how much it contributes. And here is where I think some questions come up as to whether a actual proactive contribution to neglected diseases is in fact an obligation or is this something that we wish pharmaceutical companies would do, something that is socially desirable. Public disclosure, as I argued in the previous slide, I think does easily fall under respect, but when it comes to proactive uh, contributions to neglected disease research, or I'll, I'll be the first to say that I wish companies would do more of this, um, I'm not entirely sure that this would fall under the banner of respect. Second, uh, companies, or guideline 24, excuse me, companies should consult widely with the World Health Organization and other organizations uh, with a view to enhancing their contribution. And again, I raise the question, is it actually an obligation to carry out such consultations, or is this what we believe companies should do, that either this is a good way for a company to operate. Moving on to guideline number 25, companies should engage constructively with key international and other initiatives searching for new approaches to research and development, and I would raise the same question here. Uh, and then shifting gears and moving into some of the more direct um, intellectual property provisions. Um, so let me, let me pause for a second at the end of neglected diseases. I think some of the obligations on companies or the, the um, or the call on companies to engage proactively in neglected diseases fall under the area of a socially desirable practice, but uh, in my view would not quite uh, be an obligation on, on all companies. So let's shift gears a little bit now, looking at guideline 26, and this is where we start to get into the uh, IP provision. Here it states that the company should respect the right of countries to use to the full the provisions of the TRIPS agreement and not to lobby for more demanding protection of intellectual property. And even in the language of respect, it's, it's very clear this is a do no harm type of provision. Moving to number 27, the company should respect the letter and spirit of the Doha Declaration. Uh, number 28, the company should not impede those states that wish to implement uh, paragraph 6 of the Doha Declaration. Again, I think clearly cases of respect. 
Uh, third, moving towards the least developed countries to have an extension until at least 2016 to uh, implement or enforce pharmaceutical patents. Companies should not lobby for such countries to grant or enforce patents. So I'm going to pause here, and this is where the, the section on, on TRIPS ends. Uh, and I think in these areas it's quite clear that the companies are being asked to refrain from lobbying for certain provisions that would be um, harmful for access. And then we move again into areas where Paul Hunt calls on companies to be more proactive. So here he says that companies should issue non-exclusive voluntary licenses in low-income and middle-income countries, which should include appropriate safeguards, and that the terms of the licenses should be disclosed. In terms of the terms of licenses should be, uh, being disclosed, I think this easily falls under, again, the argument for transparency as being a core component of respect. But whether this is an obligation versus something that we, again, should call on companies to do, that societies would like companies to do, I think uh, is open to debate. Um, wrapping up the last few guidelines, uh, again, there are a few other areas where, where the Paul Hunt guidelines ask for proactive behavior. So uh, on the issue of test data or data exclusivity, the, uh, the guidelines state that the company should waive test data exclusivity in these developed countries, also when a compulsory license is issued in a middle income country. Um, whether or not we agree with this particular um, formulation, which I, I happen to, to disagree with. One of the questions that comes up is, is this in fact likely to be an effective way in which to ensure that data exclusivity is not put in place? Or is it more likely that data exclusivity would uh, be less of a barrier or a non-barrier for access of states, in fact, that adopted their obligations not to implement data exclusivity provisions in their national laws or, or through trade agreements? Moving to the next one, in low and middle income countries, the company should not apply for patents for insignificant or trivial modifications of existing medicines. And again, the guidelines are asking companies to do something proactively, and I would like to raise the question, would this not be uh, much more uh, reliable and easily implementable if in fact states implement uh, higher standards of patentability, as, as Professor Chapman was just, um, was just arguing for? And I think this is the last one, or the, one of the last few that I'm looking at. Uh, when companies are implementing, formulating and implementing their policies, they, ensure, they should ensure that medicines are accessible to disadvantaged individuals, community, and populations, including those living in poverty and the very poorest in all markets. Uh, again, I would argue this is primarily an obligation of states. While it would be wonderful if companies do that, I'm not sure that this is a reasonable expectation. Uh, and that such policy should include differential pricing between countries, differential pricing within countries, commercial voluntary licenses, not-for-profit voluntary licenses, donation programs, and public-private partnerships. Again, this is a whole host of measures that our companies are being asked to proactively take. Uh, and I, I would like to raise a question, would access to medicines not be better served if, in fact, states took more seriously their obligations uh, to ensure that, that medicines were affordable and accessible, rather than relying on a host of, of voluntary measures? Uh, and then these are these are actually the last two. Um, regarding pricing, the Hunt guidelines continue to assert that uh, companies should take into account a country's stage of economic development uh, or different uh, levels of purchasing power within a country, and they should perhaps engage in uh, differentially priced and packaged products. Again, socially desirable is this an obligation uh, that's subject to debate. And then finally, the arrangements should extend to all medicines, including those for for non communicable diseases. So, what are some some conclusions that can be drawn from this small sampling of um, of the forty seven guidelines? I didn't go through all of them. I think that in terms of the applicability of the ranking framework uh, of respect versus what I would call socially desirable, sometimes those distinctions are quite clear, but not always. I think there are areas where there's room for reasonable people to disagree, um, but that there are certainly a number of guidelines and a number of areas where the notion of respect is, is quite clear and straightforward. And as a result, I think that the human rights framework can be quite useful for emphasizing business responsibilities to do no harm, and that in fact, in broader policy debates, that uh, that particular aspect of the obligations of companies merits greater attention. I think in the, in the media and in the general public debate, we often hear, I think, too much emphasis on voluntary sort of social, uh, corporate social responsibility rather than the responsibility to refrain from certain behaviors. 
I would say that there's greater attention warranted in general to the baseline of respect, uh, such as refraining from lobbying that is counterproductive to access to medicines, and greater transparency on licensing, pricing, advocacy, uh, and lobbying more generally. Moving beyond the notion of respect to what might be more broadly socially desirable, what we would like companies to do, what we believe companies should do, I'd like to raise the question for debate uh, among the audience as to how useful or credible is it to frame this as an obligation versus as something that is, uh, that is a, a good thing to do for society. Uh, and secondly, how likely are such guidelines or such normative claims to actually shame, uh, shape firm behavior? And the conclusion that we heard from the previous presentation was that, in fact, these guidelines have not uh, had the effect that, that we wish that they would. Uh, if state engagement is actually likely to be needed through, for example, regulation or incentives, then we need to I think, shift some of the emphasis back to state obligations uh, and, and put much more political attention on the responsibility of governments. Thank you very much. As I said, this is a work in progress, so I welcome your comments and questions at, uh, at this email address. Thank you.